Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dam's Gone Wild, regaining control over a misbehaving digital asset management system. My name is David Diamond. I direct uh, global marketing for Picture Park, who are hosting this webinar today. I've been in the dam industry for more than 15 years, and I authored Dam Survival Guide, um, which actually a free excerpt of avail is available now from Picture Park at picturepark.com slash free damn book. You can see that URL on the screen. With me today is Ryan Messier and Jake Jarrock, both from Harley Davidson. Ryan is the dam specialist who's been with Harley for two years. He manages the day-to-day -day operations of the dam. And Jake is a program manager of creative services. He joined Harley six years ago, and he actually managed the implementation of the dam. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk today about the how to identify the signs of trouble in a misbehaving dam, as if that is a challenge for anybody. Um, and then th the most important part is understanding what went wrong, so you can create a correction plan. So it's a really simple agenda today, but we're hoping that it delivers some pretty good uh, uh, information for you. Um, on your uh, on the side of your screen, you've got that control panel for GoToWebinar. So we ask that you just type in, if you've got questions, type in the questions, and at the end of the uh, webinar, we're going to have a little Q&A session where we will try to answer some of those questions. Um, okay, so we get started. Identifying the signs of trouble. So first of all, you can't find things. Assets in the dam are digitally lost, which I think was a term Jake uh, coined for me, which I love. So they're not getting used. Uh, users don't know how to how they're supposed to use the dam system, and dam managers are asked for personal assistance too much. Guys, tell us about your experience with these points. Yeah, what I mean by digitally lost is if metadata isn't properly put into the the um, attached to the image, or the wrong metadata is in the image, uh, it's nearly impossible to find that asset. I mean, we've had situations where um, we found some assets when we were moving from one system to the other, the developers found them that had literally no metadata to them. So right. we could not find them. When he moved them to the new system, he actually just put missing in in the uh, description. Right. And when we did a search for missing, we came up with all these images, and it turned out that most of them were amazing photography. Um, mm. Unfortunately, we could not use one of them because we didn't know anything about them. We didn't know the rights. We didn't know um, who shot them. And we couldn't go back even to the photographer and, and find out what the rights were because we didn't know who shot them. Um, so, you know, there's a lot, unfortunately a lot of situations like that um, that we're finding from old, old imagery that um, we just can't use it. It's digitally lost or can't be found. And that's actually an interesting point because people pursue digital, digital asset management with the assumption that it helps prevent the loss of, of their digital assets. And so it's your, what you're saying here is that if metadata standards aren't adhered to or metadata practices aren't adhered to, I should say, um, something can become just as lost inside the dam as it ever was on file servers or user computers. Absolutely correct. Yeah. So what, So this, the, the, the result of this was that you guys were asked to find things a lot, right? So you were uh, they were coming to you and saying, hey, guys, I'm looking for something. Can you get it for me? How, yeah, how, so how often was that going on? This, is, this was happening on a daily basis. I mean, all day. My job turned into what, or, or find, my job turned into finding assets for people, which completely is defeating the purpose of having a damn system. Right. The reason why you have a damn system is so people can find the, the stuff themselves without having a person find it for them. And, you know, if the system's not working, people can't find what they're looking for. Well, guess what? It, your job is now to find it for them. Right. So you, became, exactly you, you, be, you became the human asset manager, the ham, I guess. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right. So let's go. We'll move on here to <clears throat> the other issue that we mentioned was approvals take too long, that users weren't sure when an asset was available for or approved for use. Um, the approvals had to go outside of the dam. In other words, you needed email, you needed phones, you needed whatever to, to actually secure an approval. And then the people who were responsible for the approvals were resistant to participating in the dam. So what, was, what were your experiences along these lines? 
Um, here, here at Harley Davidson, we have a, a lot of different owners of assets. Like, for instance, if marketing or motor clothes or parts and accessories goes out and does a shot, or, or does you know shots for for whatever their purposes are, they give them to us to, to put them on the dam. So then, we basically claim them as the owners of those assets. If somebody comes onto the dam system, orders those assets, we need to get approval from those owners. Well, what was happening is we would we would have an uh, uh, order, mm -hmm. and if that order had multiple owners attached to those images, I would have to go outside the system, email each one of those those owners individually, and get their appro approval for using those assets. Well, sometimes this would take days, sometimes it would take even up to, to weeks, and and people were just getting frustrated. You know, they were ordering assets, needed them immediately in most cases. And and couldn't get them because the process was taking so long, and we were going outside of the system, and it just wasn't working. I see. And then the, the, the net result is that people are just sort of not believers in the dam system anymore because it just ends up being a little bit more cumbersome than than other workflows. Is that what you were experiencing? It's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Exactly it. Okay. Now with, the, now with our new system, everything is a lot faster, so people have actually gotten spoiled, and if it's not approved in 30 seconds to a minute, then they start uh, start knocking on our doors. <laughs> right. The, yeah. the, the responsibility is moving upstream. People like, why can't it just know? I would like this to just know what's going on here. Yeah, that's the that, – yeah, welcome to the world of the damn software vendors. But uh, Okay. All right, the other issue was the content use errors. Uh, drafts or old versions get published, wrong assets get used because users don't know the subject matter, and then you've got brand tarnishing or even legal consequences. Now, I think in our, in our discussions before, you, you were saying that drafts and old versions weren't so much a problem for you, but wrong assets and the legal issues became an issue. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, some stories that come to the front of my mind um, are we, we had a a couple of years ago, we had a conference, and I got a phone call in the middle of that conference saying, we have uh, an image on one of our posters of a bike that we don't even sell anymore. <laughs> How did they possibly get this asset? Well, of course, you know, <laughs> that made my blood pressure rise, and, you know, thank God it wasn't a, a huge issue because people that were at those conferences were our dealers and, and whatnot, but still, it just made the company look bad, and that's not something that, that we take lightly. Um, another instance of it uh, is uh, we, we had assets go out that we didn't, or for approval, that, or that were approved that had the wrong metadata in them, um, uh -huh. uh, saying that we had rights to use that image, and, and, we, and we definitely did not have rights to use that image. So um, there were some legal ramifications for that. I'm not sure how that uh, came out, but uh, it's another example of, you know, getting the, the metadata right and, and perfect the first time. And, and it's interesting because it's, it's, it's a sort of a nice callback to what you were saying about the digitally lost assets where you've got, you know, now that you've been burnt by, by someone pursuing you saying you didn't have rights to use that image, now you've got all of these images that, that had lost their metadata. And now I'm sure Harley is probably quite sensitive about how those images can be used now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely put some restrictions in. Uh, magnifying glass on us in certain circumstances, for sure. Right. Okay. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about how to understand what actually went wrong. Um, the user factor. So educational materials are not available to users. This is, of course, getting them to actually read or watch videos or all is a different story, but. Uh, another issue is that they're not consulted about usability and workflows. This is the, the classic case of the user say, look, you know what, this is not how I work, and nobody asked me. And the result of this can be just ignorance that becomes indifference and then ultimately impatience, um, which is, of course, no fun for the dam managers. What were, what were your experiences with, uh, with users on this? Uh, one thing that I learned early on, if you don't have the proper training tools or uh, easy to use help guide, um, people will shy, eventually shy away from the system and um, and once people start shying away from the system, it's really difficult to bring them back. So I believe this is, uh, is imperative.
imperative for to have it right and have it uh, uh, the right tools in place mm -hmm. to help people uh, find what they're looking for and how to use the system. So in that when you before the launch of that first system, and I, I think actually if I remember, we know that this definitely predated Jake, and I think Ryan it predated you um, maybe as well. But did were users consulted about the way that they wanted to work with a digital asset management system, or was it sort of just just decided for them? No, again, uh, a, thing, a thing that I learned early on. We thought we knew what the rest of the company or stakeholders in the company wanted and needed. Um, we were definitely wrong because it, when we <laughs> launched our second system, um, it there was a lot of a lot of people complaining that that why weren't they consulted? They could have done this and done that. But what ended up happening is we went back and tried to customize the system for each one of those stakeholders. We ended up spending way more money than we would have in the first place, and um, a lot more time and energy. You know, so it was really it. It ended up costing us more money in the end, for sure. Okay. All right. So that's uh, that makes sense. And then there was the institutional knowledge, and you've got with with Harley Davidson. We're talking about a company that goes way, way, way back. So this is you're not like a, a startup here, uh, but only the longtime employees understood the metadata language of your dam. In other words, like you know what the models, what the terms were, all these different things that you had there. Um, and only the owners of the assets knew how the assets were to be worked or how the assets were to be used and all that. And then these workflow steps were unclear to new employees who came in. And, and presumably over the years, you, a big organization gets a lot of new employees. Tell us a bit about this. Um, this company relied a lot on tribal knowledge or what we call tribal knowledge around here. Um, you know, we didn't really document too many things. We <laughs> We just went off of what people said. You know, people were always there. Was uh, usually, if somebody came and started working at Harley Davidson, they stayed here. You know, so there was a uh, a lot of knowledge that if you came in new, you didn't know about. Well, after a while, we <laughs> we got smart and we started documenting things and putting processes in place. So if somebody new came in, it wasn't learning all over again. Everybody was using the same processes and the same. Um, policies. Right. If somebody, if somebody got hit by a bus, <laughs> for lack of better words, um, you know, we we would be up the the creek without a paddle. Um, we'd basically be starting over, um, retraining those people, uh, or not retraining those people, re, re, retraining the uh, the replacement of those people. So right now, we put everything on paper. Uh, so all the workflows and everything are exactly the same no matter who's uh, doing them. Okay. And then the the other, the last point we wanted to make on what went wrong was the dam software itself. You had workarounds became the norm and workflows left the dam so often that the dam itself became optional. And you've got performance, usability, and reliability issues mm -hmm. discrediting the dam across the organization. What can you say about all that? Yeah, basically, if if the system doesn't work, people work around it and if people are working around it it's the the death of the system um, uh, so you know if, some, if somebody starts losing trust in the system they're not going to use it anymore and and you know that's going to be the death of it um, so it, yeah it's imperative to, to get the workflows right and the um, policies in place so, but did you have the? I mean, was was it getting to the point where your entire, or not the entire workflow, but many of the workflows were actually outside the dam to the point where people were asking what the point of the dam was? Yes. Yep. Yep. It, it definitely was was that bad at, at one point in time. Um, it was almost to the point where uh, we spent lots of money for absolutely no reason, and, and uh, we came to the end of the road where we had to make a decision: do we? stick a lot of money in this and make it right and do it right the first time or do we just uh, leave it behind and forget about it and let it, you know, uh, die, I guess. And thank thankfully, uh, leadership decided to invest in it and, and uh, now we have something pretty awesome. Okay, so uh, let me ask you, that you, now, you've gone through a situation which I know a lot of organizations are, are they have, they ultimately they contemplate switching from one damn system to another. And this is, 
this is not easy, no matter what system you're coming from or what system you're going to. At what point did you decide to actually abandon the old system to go with the new system? And how did you arrive at that being the best decision? Uh, we, we got to a point where we customized some of these out-of-box solutions so much that things in their solution stopped working. For instance, if we customized the ordering process so much, all of a sudden things started happening with the search engine. Other things started to not work, um, and developers, you know, got to a point where they didn't even know what was going on. We realized that we needed we needed our own custom solution so bad that there was no out of box solution that w w would work for us. So we built from the ground up. I see. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's, again, we'll shift gears and we'll talk about the creation, the correction plan, excuse me. Uh, so the first point we wanted to make was the initiative ownership, to define and agree upon who is responsible for the dam's success, to identify who has the authority to approve corrections and expenditures, that one's important, and to start a dam team that includes reps from all the stakeholder departments. So tell us about how you guys addressed these issues. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, it's absolutely imperative to find out who the the major players in the company are and the stakeholders that are going to be using the system, find out what they need, how they're using the system so you can help them find out what they need and uh, start there. Uh, if, if you don't have that, it doesn't even make any sense to go any further. Right. And so, so when, when you, with regard to like making these decisions, and, and you're making pretty big decisions that, have, that affect um, a large, I mean, a large organization and, a, and an awful, no, awful lot of employees there, who has the authority to make these decisions? Is that, do you guys have that or do you have to go to some senior manager someplace to get the blessing for all this stuff? No, no. Fortunately, we, we actually do have, um, we have that power to, to do what we need to do or what we find from the company needs to be done. Um, when it comes to the money part of it or getting the dollars, that, that goes up the chain to our leadership. Um, we have to convince them that the company needs this before we get the money. Right. And, and so who is responsible for your dam's success? Um, it, that pretty much falls on, on my and Ryan's shoulders. Okay, so why are you doing this webinar? Shouldn't you be working on your dam? <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> okay. Thanks, David. Uh, uh, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't hang up yet. We're only halfway through. <laughs> okay, so the next thing that you you design, you did a redesign on paper, which is, I think, a great idea. You interview users about the problems, document and listen to what they actually say. That's important to really listen to what they say. Uh, a review of existing policies and procedures and to figure out do they address the user concerns that you learned about in the interview. So it, it's like a one, two step process there. And of course revise and create new policies and procedures as necessary. Uh, draft the proposed improvements and share those with select users and managers. So tell us about how you resolved this issue. This was actually, a, this whole story, this was, this was the part that I loved the best. Yeah, so if you're not writing things down, here's where you want to start because it's going to save you a lot of trouble and a lot of time If uh, because we've been down this road numerous times. This is what, this is what we did and this is what worked. Um, we started out with a survey basically to benchmark where we currently um, were, um, what the, the company currently thought that we were doing right and what we were doing wrong. Um, and after that survey, we created a committee with stakeholders throughout the company, um, some of those big, uh, big players that um, definitely could contribute to the success of the dam. Mm -hmm. um, we created a, a gap analysis from um, that information. And I, I'm talking that this is months. You know, this isn't we sat down for a day and did this. This, this was over months um, that we figured these things out. Um, we created a gap analysis to find out exactly where we were and where we needed to be. Um, we turned that into a, a functional spec, and we used that spec to go out and get uh, uh, bids and, and estimates from companies to find out exactly how much money we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then we took that and went back to leadership and said, you know, if, if we're going to do this right, this is what it's going to cost. And uh, you know, it, it was more money up, up front for sure, 
-hmm. But in that, we saved a lot of money. You know, it's like the dam systems are not something you can do half-assed. Right. Like either you do it or you don't, and that's my opinion. I've been through this. This is my third time I've been through this. Um, doing it right the first time is for sure the right right thing to do. So, um, so we're tell, not perfect, but go ahead. You're, no, I was going to say. So, tell me about the Reds document. This is something you mentioned in our in our pre-interview that was that I think is really compelling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Reds document. Um, we tried the Reds document is what we call. Um, Ryan, help me with this. Required, required electronic document standards. Yeah, so <laughs> we we tried the uh, numerous iterations of this. Basically, what what it is is getting um, owners, getting photographers, getting photographer assistants, everybody on the same page, collecting the same metadata in the same fashion. Therefore, having a consistency on the dam. Uh, so we, we literally walk through step by step um, what fields need to be um, captured mm -hmm. and what what that meant and what it was for. Why, why do we need that information? And for whatever reason, when we called it red, um, that stuck because it went from being an option to being required. And <laughs> when something is required, apparently it sticks. Um, <laughs> our our marketing team uh, team accepted it. And they now, anytime they hire a photographer or do something outside this company, that red document is the first thing most people get. Okay, great. So uh, that's uh, um, I, I mean, basically you're 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 building a specification for the thing, which is great. Yeah, and again, okay. that's something we did not we did not have right from the beginning. Now we have it right, and now we're getting the information we need. Okay, so on the on the taxonomy and controlled vocabularies, you've got a to, you're suggesting you document and justify every metadata value you plan to track and get buy-in for that. Decide if standard support is necessary. Build taxonomies and controlled vocabularies that experts can under no, excuse me that non-experts can understand and get buy-in for those. And then draft a plan for migrating the metadata identify some test assets and run some tests. So how did you talk about some of the ways you built your taxonomies and, and, and decided on these terms? Um, we actually went outside the company to help us with this. We, we still don't have it perfect. It's actually something that um, we're focusing on a lot right now. Um, but the third party consultant um, is helping us build um, a metadata schema so we can can really standardize this information. Um, and then from there, um, I, I'm not sure what our next move is going to be. I don't know if it's actually hiring a, a librarian or um, archivist, but uh, we, we need to get the metadata right. Um, it's something we've been putting off and is, in my opinion, one of the most important things in a dam system. Because again, going back to the first question, if things are digitally lost, doesn't matter what's in there. You can have 100,000 assets, and if the right information is not there, you're not going to find them. And, and I thought uh, on the on the migrating metadata, what, uh, something that you, that you had done, which I thought was very interesting, was that you did a massive export of your metadata into Excel, and then did your the transformations that you needed in Excel to import into the new system. Because this is it, it, when when people go through a, a digital asset management system cleanup. A lot of times they don't think about the fact that once they've got the, the new improved way of doing things, they somehow have to map the old values onto the new values. This is particularly in, uh, important if you've got a free field that required no controlled vocabulary before and all of a sudden now you're imposing a controlled vocabulary. Somehow you have to figure out the mapping of that stuff. And you used Excel for that. So that was, that was the best option? Then that worked okay for you? Yeah, at the time... Um at the time we used Excel, now we use um, XMP, but XML. It, or XML, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, at the time it, it was the thing that, that worked the best. I mean, it was a really, really long process. I mean, we had to figure out what fields we, what we needed and what fields we didn't. And any information in the fields that we didn't, we had to migrate to another field. So yeah, it was a a very 
convoluted process, but it was we had to manually do it and and go through it one image at a time. And we have uh, I don't know 160,000 assets at this point. Wow. So okay. yeah, it, it was a there's no easy way of doing it, but you got to grit your teeth and and do it really. Right. Okay. All right. And then the hire and trust real experts. I, I put the real in parentheses in there because, you know, there's, there's everybody's a damn expert. So it's kind of hard sometimes to find the ones who really are, are worthwhile. Um, but an archivist, librarian, or reputable information professional should review your plans. Um, an independent damn software consultant or analyst should compare your plans and goals to your software. This one's important because you can sort out your own goals and then realize that the software that you're using is just completely ill-suited to those goals. So it's nice to have somebody who can really draw that comparison for you. And and you mentioned this already, but if you think that this is too much money, just the costs of having to do this all over again um, will just be astronomical. And the cost of not doing this is that your entire investment in this damn initiative is just virtually wasted. So what, tell us a little bit more about the, uh, I think you said you had somebody even internal to Harley Davidson that was going to be able to help you with this stuff, but tell us about this. Um, Ryan, you want to you wanna take this one? On the librarian? Well, we currently have on retainer a uh, third party that uh, they work really well with our developers. So it allows them to... Uh, it allows them to kind of hash out some of the back-end development stuff mm -hmm. that allows us to kind of step back and make some of those decisions. And uh, in the end, it, their relationship is really strong, and we kind of work well with them to kind of just push everything along where we don't necessarily have to be making coding decisions. Um, I would say that's been extremely beneficial to us, and... It's definitely helped out our processes and everything being built along the way. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, there, I have to say that it, to hear about an organization that that recognizes what an archivist, librarian, or information pro can actually bring to the table here, this is refreshing because I I find in in the hundred years that I've been in this industry that this is usually where organizations cut budget first, and this ends up, in my opinion, being one of the reasons that, that so many damn initiatives fail is because they just didn't think about the, uh, the organization element and they didn't have that unbiased third party sort of reflecting their plans back in their face to say, look, this part makes total sense and this part is a mess. Uh, it's, some, it's difficult to see that in, in, internally sometimes. Right, and we recognize when we're not the specialists in a certain area, so we're letting we're willing to kind of let things go, especially in some of the especially in some of the coding areas, because that's definitely not something we're great at. Right. Okay. And then we've got engage, educate, and engage users. So policy plus procedure plus purpose equals a deeper understanding that stands on its own. And that one, that one, I like that one because. It's pretty common for organizations to understand that they need to, under, they need to educate people on policy and procedure. What they sometimes don't follow through with is, under, is educating users on the purpose behind those policies and procedures. And I think that when people really understand why they're doing something, they have a better appreciation for that. And then when they get themselves in situations where there is no policy or procedure to govern them, they can refer to the intent of the policy and procedures that they know to understand, well, this is probably what I should do in this situation. And then you've also got um, document your damn configuration. And in that documentation, of course, refer to the policy procedures and purpose. So don't just say you're supposed to do this and then you're supposed to do that. You say you're supposed to do this because this helps you adhere to this policy and this is the reason why it makes sense to do so. And then provide ongoing scheduled training that works for your users. That one's important because, uh, for example, if the training that you provide is a 200-page written document, probably that's not going to work so great for users, and then you basically nullify the effect of educating. And then ultimately make it easier for your users to comment. If, if there's something is wrong in the DAM, um, you want them, if it's just an email address or maybe it's a widget inside the DAM itself, there's some way for users to be able to connect with people responsible for the dam so that they can communicate issues. So tell us about that. Yeah, I'll start from the, the bottom and go back up. Um, the comment 
uh, comments, we always want to know what we could do better. Um, we know it's a moving target, so we we have a, a comment um, field on our, not, it's not even a field, it's a link to an email um, for people to send comments back to us. So we're always getting up-to-date information of what's going, what's not working, you know, um, what we can do better. Um, as far as training, this is something we recognized as being a, a big issue. Um, if it doesn't matter how intuitive the system is, people still, certain people still have issues with it, and it doesn't necessarily work for what or how they think it should work. Right. Um, therefore, we uh, we we created a help section for people. It used to be just documentation, and it was a lot of information, like you were just um, commenting on. Uh, you can get a big, pretty big document, pretty easy. Um, so what what Ryan did in the help of our uh, third party consultant, um, they created little two to three minute uh, dam videos, uh, our user help videos. So you know, for instance, how to log in, um, how to order an asset. Um, e each one of these things would be a, a two to three minute um, video mm -hmm. on, on how to do it. Um, it's worked out great. So did, did you, let me just ask you on that point, did you ever, like what you're explaining here, it, it sounds um, a lot like what, what software vendors do for their, for their software. Did you, did, did your marketing department help with this at all or did you, did you do this entirely on your own? No, we did it entirely on our own. Uh, pretty much everybody in this company, is, as in any company in, in this country right now, um, everybody is overworked. Nobody yeah. has any extra time. And, uh, so we, we did this on our own. Okay. We probably could have used marketing's help, but we didn't. Okay. Uh, uh, going, going back up to uh, the top questions, uh, the, the why is very important. Why you're doing something, for sure, you need to have in there. And that's where the red, I think why the red has worked out um, really well for us, because we have in there why we need the information. Therefore, if somebody's in a situation where <laughs> where they need to make a decision on their own why they need certain information they have they have that why so they can make that information or uh, make that decision on their own right if they're not if there's somebody not that that's not there telling them the the decision to make they can make it on their own because they have that information right it, it, it's essentially parenting right it's you don't you know you're not always there for your kids so you want to instill them with the information they need to make good decisions when there's nothing there to make a decision for them right exactly exactly yeah okay so the last part of this correction plan that we've got is to actually make sure that you've improved things um, this is important because a lot of times people change dam systems just because they're not working but then they don't work any better and they just continue to change it over time so schedule user surveys and then again ask marketing for help if marketing is capable or, or willing to uh, participate in this marketing loves surveys so if you say hey help us with the survey they're going oh, we love surveys Right. Um, and then dam statistics can help track usage. So if you've got, um, as a hint, when you've got a bunch of digitally lost files that are in there, um, they might just never be accessed. And that might be a clue to you that there's some metadata problem with those assets. So, so statistics do more than just tell you what's popular. They can also point you to where you have metadata problems. Right. And plan and promote the relaunch of your dam. And in this case, asking management for help. Uh, so that you can actually have it publicized throughout the company or get that that just that extra little boost of uh, of attention that it might need and then schedule a policy and procedure review process if it's annually or however long makes sense for you and then make adapt ad, dam adaptations as you need them so tell us about uh, about how you make sure that you improve things at Harley yeah so um, like we were talking about earlier surveys are a big thing for us um, they really help. Um, you know, I mean, it, without getting that information, you, you really don't know what's going on out there. So surveys are are a, a big thing. Um, we use analytics to find out what our to track what our our users are doing, and and you know, we use that information to improve certain areas or to um, push uh, users in certain directions. Just to, based on how they're using the system. Um, uh, 
to plan and pro to promote the relaunch, uh, we have an internet site. We actually call it Ride Fitting, right? Um, <laughs> we have an internet site that we can um, leverage to promote and, and um, let people know that there's new enhancements coming or a new system or what they expect right. or to push user guides or, you know, we've even published, like, tips and tricks on the dam just to get people reengaged with the system at certain times. Um, this is the policy. I, I, I just I interject. I mean, when you're telling me all this stuff, it, this to me sounds like what would happen after marketing got involved. But you guys are just doing this without the involvement of uh, of the promotion experts, and this is really commendable. Yeah, for for the exact reason I mentioned before, everybody's too busy, and yeah. and nobody has the time to put towards something like this. You know. So let me for, ask for you. That, I, I'm just I'm sorry. I, just, I want to ask you about the surveys because I think people might wonder about this. When we say that we're surveying people, are we are we asking them two questions, or are we asking them fifty questions, or how? And, and are you do are you conducting this through online surveys, or how does that work? Yeah, we use uh, online surveying. Um, we have uh, on this last survey. I'm just happening to be looking at it right now. I think we have seven questions um, based on one to one to five. You know, they strongly disagree or strongly agree. Right. Um, and then we have three open ended questions where there's text fields. Just to give you an example of some of the questions, um, am I able to find assets I'm looking for in an acceptable time frame? Um, it's one through five, strongly agree, you know, three if I'm, you know, on the fence or, or whatever. But we, uh, we purposely ask um, very uh, emotional driven questions because you're, you want to get the answer. You don't want to get a in between, you know, you want either a five or a one. Right. Um, Another question that we ask: uh, the dam, the dam, per, or the dam system is the first place I go when I need an asset. So, you know, again, people are going to be answering either one or five. Yes, that, that's the first place I go, or one. No, I, I don't go to the dam system first. Um, one of the open-ended questions is: what, what else? Would, uh, what assets do you often need that you would like to see more of on the dam? So, you know, it's an open field. People. Uh, stakeholders, there's a lot of things that they wish they had access to. You know, for instance, a Harley Davidson employee working on a computer. You know, it doesn't seem like something we would need, but funny enough, it's something that that we're asked for a lot. You know, that people are doing presentations or they're, you know, not not necessarily everything's an ad. Something, a lot of yeah. things are done internally or for internal stakeholders. So, um, you know, these are getting answers to to questions that that we have. And so what kind of, uh, now this is the marketer in me asking this, what kind of a response rate do you get? First of all, how, about how many different employees do you survey, and then what, what would you say the percentage of them that respond is? Um, I, think, uh, I think the last survey was about 50% actually responded. Wow, that's um, very good. And funny enough, we actually get some, some pretty good scores. I think just having a survey and caring enough to ask the questions is impressionable on people, you know what I mean? So they tend to, to score higher. Um, but we do get some very very valuable information back from them um, from the survey. Okay. That answer your question. Yeah, it does. You guys are quite impressive. I <laughs> I have to say this. But, okay. It so, took a long time to get here. Yeah. I think we're impressed that we still have a lot of work to do, but, you know. Yeah, but I mean, at least, I mean, you've just got the structure in place to just sustain the dam. That's, and that's, so much of this is uh, is not recognized by people. They think that, that digital asset management is all about software, and it's not about software. It's about all this other stuff that you guys are talking about. Absolutely. So let's do a review here. So define the dam ownership and the authority. Design on paper first, which includes interviewing your users. To build your taxonomies and control vocabularies, and then plan your metadata migration and, and do some tests to make sure that that's actually going to work. Um, get your experts to review plans, or if you've got them from the very start, that's even better for you. Educate and engage the users, measure your results, rinse and repeat. Any, any final statements on any of that stuff from you guys? Yeah, one thing that we didn't, didn't, didn't cover, and I'll do it quickly. Um, we review the dam every year. So whether we think it needs it or not, we still go out there and try to find out 
what we're missing, what we could do better, where we're lagging, whatever it may be. Sometimes it, it's nothing, or I, I shouldn't say sometimes it's nothing because that's never happened, but um, <laughs> it could possibly be nothing. It could be like, hey, we're doing everything perfectly, but at least we re reviewed it and took a step back and looked at it, and that's very important right. to do on a year, at least a yearly basis, if not more. Okay. All right, so be uh, just a, a word from our sponsor before we get to the Q&A. Uh, Picture Park Dam is digital asset management innovation, that modern design that works with the applications you use. Uh, Picture Park is available for the cloud, on-site, or installed software, or a hybrid. So you can choose what's best, and you can change your mind and or take advantage of both of those. And Picture Park has got a great customer satisfaction and solid growth record. We've got 99 better than 99% customer retention, more than 25% revenue increase in 2012, and offices currently in Switzerland, United States, Austria, and India. Okay, so we're gonna open the floor up here for, uh, for questions, and we have, I'll just tell you right off the bat, we have way more questions than we have time for. But uh, while we are getting some of those questions together, there are some links on this page that you can use to contact uh, any of the three of us who have been in the webinar here, there are our LinkedIn addresses there, and there's social media addresses for Picture Park, and then a link to Damn Guru Program, which is a free service from Picture Park that you should check out. Okay, so let's, I will look at the questions here, and the first one, uh, this is actually coming from David, not me, David, another David. Um, how do you guys get others at Harley Davidson to tag assets? Are there any tricks to motivate people? Yeah, the the trick is to have uh, the process and policies in place. The red the document is is the reason why we're close to being successful. You know, it's still again, it's still we still have a long road ahead of us, and it's not perfect. Uh, but that was the number one thing that turned things around for us. And was I that think. red document? I think something that we probably could emphasize even more is it it's, seems silly, but required being put on the front of that acronym really changed the game just because it was perceived as very important and needed to be done. And previous implementations were ignored, but since required was put on the front of the document, that made it all the difference, and everybody started abiding to that document. Okay, so a little terminology help there. Um, okay, we've got, uh, Carol is asking, is your dam used by all of Harley-Davidson? If so, is there a global authority who owns and controls it? Yeah, I, we're that. We're the global authority. Um, we manage the system for, uh, uh, for worldwide employees. Um, not every Harley-Davidson employee has access, but I would say probably, I don't know, 60% of the company uses the dam system. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to add to that? Well, it's not that they don't have access to it, it's just that they haven't signed up to use the dam. So anybody within the within the company can use the dam, it's just whether or not they choose to actually go through and uh, sign up for an account. Yes, thank you. We also, we we open it up to third party, um, <clears throat> excuse me, third party um, agencies that do work for Harley-Davidson. Right. So they're able to use the system if they're doing a job for Harley-Davidson. Okay. That's the only way you'll have an access if you're not an employee. Okay. And then we've got from Mike, um, once you started your dam cleanup, how did you get people to rediscover it? Um, like I mentioned before, just little little things going out on Riot or communications, tips and tricks. Um, we we sent out a big uh, um, a big advertisement, if you will, um, about the you know what they expect a new up and coming mo uh, uh, improved dam system. Uh, mm -hmm. We you know we just we we threw a lot of things out there, little little blurbs of what they expect and some of the cool features that were were coming out. Okay, we've got um, from uh, Tony. I'm curious about the number of staff that work on managing the dam in relation to the total number of employees that use the dam. Hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, there's Ryan and myself. We are the dam team, and Ryan does the day-to-day, -day and um, I'm more involved with the uh, long-term planning of the, the system. Um, 
we we have a third party consultant um, that that helps us out. Other than that, you're you're uh, you're actually listening to the whole damn team. So really, nothing is going on at Harley right now with regard to improving your dam. They're they're going where are where's the dam team? That's exactly right. I've gotten three Twitter feeds that people are asking me why am I not working and not this season. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Um, this is a good one. Jeremy is asking how many people are on your dam team. So did you start out with a full team or add people over time? Isn't, isn't that the same question as we just answered? Well, I'm guessing that that he that he's talking about the uh, the one that includes the stakeholders from all the different departments. Oh, like our committee? What yeah, we call our committee. Right. Um, you know, uh, anywhere from like seven to twelve people, I'd say. You know, most of the time you you'll get like fifteen people that show up the first meeting, and then you'll get like nine the second meeting, and then you'll have eleven. The you know, it's like. It, it fluctuates. Like I said, everybody's so busy that you'll get uh, a mix of people coming in and out of that meeting. And we like to have, you know, like four or five of those meetings so we really can get a clear picture of what, what is needed. Um, sometimes we'll have sideline conversations with with uh, with stakeholders that need more attention or have more things to say. But right. um, uh, for the most part, two dozen people, I guess, or a dozen or so people. Okay. All right. And Sherry is asking, is, is your REDS document um, available online for everyone at Harley-Davidson? I'm wondering how people learn about it. Our marketing really drives that REDS document. Um, like I said, it, if somebody's doing any kind of shoots for us, it's typically through them or through us. Therefore, mm -hmm. their first contact with us is, here you go, here's the REDS document. You know, use it as your Bible. Um, because we're not accepting anything unless you follow this, so okay. um, that that's how we implement it. We don't we don't listen unless they have it or use it. Okay. And from Jose, we have: Do you have different languages for metadata? Or you, we are, no no we do not. Okay. That's something that we've we've thought about. Um, it hasn't been <laughs> it hasn't been an issue yet, so we haven't addressed it. Unfortunately, that's how things work around here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is a good one from Edward. What is your single biggest challenge with regard to keeping your dam in good shape? Um, metadata. Number one, metadata. I mean, if the metadata isn't working for you, it's working against you. Right. Right, right. Yeah, and I think it all, our search is probably the biggest uh, issue that we have as far as a uh, as far as like a tool on the dam, and that ties straight into metadata. So uh, it always kind of seems to loop back into metadata and keywording. Right. Okay. Right. Trust, trust me, we looked in every area of the dam looking for all these problems, but it always led straight back to the search, which stemmed from the metadata. Okay, got it. Um, Andrea, we're actually six minutes over time, but we're gonna we're gonna get a few more of these things in here as long as there's people still out there listening. Um, Andrea asks, who defines the policies that control how your assets are used? I would think that with such a strong brand, this would be taken very seriously. Yeah, a absolutely it is. Um, we have a whole team of people that do nothing but that. They, they review everything that comes in and out of this company. So. Um, they don't necessarily review the imagery or the assets that get approved in a dam, mm -hmm. but they approve the final um, contract. Project. Yeah, or contract going out. So, um, yeah, we have a, a full team that does that. And luckily, every project manager that is in charge of doing the specific photo shoot, they get those contracts taken care of on their end. So mm -hmm. for the most part, we don't have to deal with those contracts, but we are in charge of making sure that if an asset expires on a certain date, that it is removed at the proper date. Okay. And we've got from, from uh, Danielle, it sounds like it's sort of a similar question, um, but a little bit different. She's asking... Who determines what which assets get populated into the dam, or do you just put everything in there? Um, no, we we definitely try to manage what goes in because we don't want to saturate the system either. You know, we don't want thousands of images coming back for a single search. Um, 
we do the most the majority of that but we get input from marketing or the owner of those assets um, but we do get drives with I mean 18 20 30,000 um, assets on them and we have to determine what's going on the system okay we've got um, Melinda asking what uh, how, let me I'm you know paraphrase this. She wants to know what types of assets you've got inside your dam. Are they photographs only or are you, are you managing other things? Uh, they're mostly imagery. I would say they're 98 percent imagery. Um, we are just starting to get into video. Um, we're pushing more video onto the system because uh, people are begging us for that right now. Okay. Um, we do have some documentary uh, or documents we um, they have some audio, but very little of both of those. Okay. We've contemplated going down in, into uh, um, uh, the word skipping, or uh, not coming to me, but uh, ba basically a project management system within the dam. But we have not done that yet. I see. Okay. Um, we And actually one just came in from Andrew. Do you integrate your dam with any other systems? We do not. We We built from the ground up so everything we do is customized okay all right okay so in uh, in club we've also got there's some comments here that are actually not questions that i just have to read because i i think they're funny um and true uh, alex says i would get nothing done if my job was to work in a dam with harley davidson photos that's <laughs> bianca says you guys are smart you already do what takes a long time in dam for uh, for me to learn, and Hana, and I'll take this one. Hana says, "What's with the dog? Is he an, a Harley Davidson mascot?" Um, Hana, he's he's not a Harley Davidson mascot. He was a um, he was a stray dog that I found in a in a stock photo house, and I wanted to give him a home, so he became the poster child for for this. And then we've got one. This one I've I've been saving because this actually came to me through email uh, before we got started from uh from Laza who's who's actually in Europe and probably still listening I'm hoping you're still listening here he said I wouldn't miss this for all the money in the world I am the company guru at least considered to be when talking about picture park and I that's his system and I'm also a big Harley Davidson fan I've got a fat boy you better make sure I got a seat cuz I'm still staying really late at work for this so I hope that's, you got it's really cool it's cool to hear <laughs> stuff like that because working in these four in these four walls, you kind of lose you lose um, the enthusiasm that people have for this company. You know, you would think that we would be like, "Oh, everybody loves Harley Davidson." Well, you don't really get that at all. You know, especially being in a damn team that doesn't deal with the outside world. So it's cool to hear stuff like that. Yeah, how enthusiastic people are about Harley Davidson. Absolutely, you've got a you've got a, an incredibly strong international brand. I think that's why so many people were drawn to this webinar uh, to, because it's uh, you know when you when you've got something as high profile as Harley Davidson, you kind of want to know how they're protecting that brand. So yeah, I, so, I hope I hope we were able to help people. I, I think so. I think we're we're getting there. Are a lot of thank yous and great jobs are coming in. So I think that that's uh, that's that's going to be good. So anyway, I want to thank Ryan and Jacob for uh, for joining us today, uh, and and send thanks to the Harley Davidson Motor Company for uh, for permitting them to take part in this webinar today. Um, it was really great, guys. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with you in the in the setup for this whole thing too. Um, and thanks to everybody who uh, who came to this. We will have a um, uh, a link to the recording that will be sent around to everybody. Uh, so you can enjoy it again and share it with others. So thanks very much, guys. And any yeah, any parting you. words to say to everybody before we go? Um, I you know I just want to let people know I, I actually really enjoy helping other people. Um, so if you want to contact me through my LinkedIn account and ask me questions, you know, I can't promise I'll get to you within a day or so, but eventually I will. Um, if I can help in any way, I'll certainly try. Okay. That sure sounds. A lot of same sentiments. Just uh, wanted to thank you, David, for the opportunity. It was it was our pleasure, really. Thanks, everybody, and and we will see you at the next uh, Picture Park webinar. Thanks very much. Talk to you later.